In today's video, I'm going to show you how to use my lighting recipe guides. And with these guides, you're going to be able to recreate hundreds of different lighting setups. Hey everybody, Lindsay Adler here, and this is going to be your guide to my guide. Now I have created many, more than a dozen different lighting recipe guides. And in these guides, I provide you everything you need to recreate the setups. I provide the modifiers, the power of the light, the distance of the light, behind the scenes, diagrams, and so much more. So you can look at this and have a holistic picture of how to recreate these shots. Now, of course, I always encourage you to use this as a starting point and then make your own modifications, your own adjustments. Now, if you're unfamiliar to studio lighting, or if you simply want to have a better understanding of how these guides should be used, well, that is what this video is for. So I'm going to take you through step-by-step step so that you can recreate a sample lighting setup from one of my headshot guides. In order to do this, however, you need a few key tools. First of all, obviously, you need the lighting recipe guide, but then you're going to need three additional things. First and foremost, you will need a tape measure. The tape measure is going to allow you to measure the distance of light the distance of the subject to the background, the height of the light, all of these different measurements that will make a difference to the end appearance of your shot. So tape measure is the first tool you need. Next up, you're going to need a light meter. Now certainly not every photographer needs a light meter. However, this is going to give us objective measurements. So that if I say that a light is set to F13, how would you do the same? Well, you're going to use a light meter to take a reading and adjust that light up or down to be precise. Of course, you can always eye things. In other words, if you look at my final shot and you compare to yours, does the light need to be brighter? Does it need to be dimmer? But if you want to actually know with precision what power the light should be at, that's where a light meter comes into play. Now, if you are going to use a light meter, I also recommend that you use a trigger. Because as you're taking these meter readings, as you're taking these measurements, you can use the trigger to fire the flash. And that's how you can read the amount of light falling onto your subject or the background. So those are the three tools that you're going to need if you wanna recreate these setups precisely. Now, if you're simply using them for inspiration, you can look at the diagram, the behind the scenes, and then dial them in yourself and get them as close as possible. But these measurements, it will get you right there to exactly recreating the shot. All right, so let's begin at the very beginning. One of the simplest measurements, which is going to be the distance of the subject to the background. The reason I wanted to start there is because this can vary. Now in this instance, I have a distance of 98 inches from my subject to the background. That's what it says in the guide. But maybe you don't have that much space. Maybe you don't have that much distance to work with where you're shooting. That's fine, you can definitely move the subject closer, just know that there may be consequences. For example, in one particular setup, maybe you have a big light, and when you move the subject and that light closer to the background, well, probably now, more of that light will spill on the background, and it'll change what the background looks like. So these are just things to keep in mind. You can change whatever you want, but there will be some visual side effect. In this shot, you can see that I used a fashion gray background. If you swap out another color, maybe I went for a, a darker gray, of course, this will also make a difference in the shot. A darker gray, maybe when I eventually light the background, I'd need to turn the power of that strobe up in order to make it the same brightness as you see in the final shot. So just keep that in mind. Every change you make will have some sort of visual consequence for better or for worse. All right, so 98 inches, let's position our subject 98 inches from the background. All right, right there gets me 98 inches. Now it's time for the fun stuff and we're going to start positioning our lights. Here's my recommendation. Take a look at the diagram and the behind the scenes first. Use those to roughly position the lights. Take a look at the approximate angles of the lights and the distance and just try to gauge. Start there and then you can make some tweaks. And one of the things that will be really helpful is if you can actually read light. What I mean by that is if you can look at a photograph and kind of analyze how it's lit. Now, of course, the lighting recipe guides help you to not have to do that, but reading and seeing light gives you immense power to make adjustments, to get the shot closer to what you want it to be. I have a video and a guide called Learning to See and Read Light. I recommend you check that out because it will tell you how to look at a shot and by analyzing the highlights, the shape of the shadows, the fill of the shadows, all of those sorts of things, you can get an idea of the placement of light, the number of lights and so on. So 
Start there, watch that, and it'll make the lighting recipe guides much easier. That being said, let's start with light number one. Now, as you can see with all of these different lights, I have listed the light modifier. In this case, it is a three foot octabox, but you may not have a three foot octabox. Now, when you're looking at a different lighting setup, you have to ask yourself, what do I have that's close that could give me a similar quality of lights? What's a similar size modifier? So in this case, I have a three foot octabox, but maybe you have no octabox, but you do have a uh, medium umbrella with diffusion. That might give you a similar quality of light. Or maybe you don't have a three foot octabox, but you do have a three by four foot softbox. Maybe that would give you a similar enough quality of light. So even if you don't have exactly the tools I have, you can use your creative problem solving and get something that's going to be very close. So let's look at some of the measurements. First and foremost, the very first measurement we have is the distance of the light to the subject. What we're going to do is we're going to measure from the subject's shoulder over to the center of the light. Now, in this case, it reads that it should be about 24 inches, so I'm going to adjust that. Let's see, 24 inches, approximately from the shoulder here. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's see what else. Next one up, I'm looking at the height above eye level. All right, now when it comes to the height of eye level, this is going to be really important to the way the light looks. What we're doing is we're approximating the middle of the modifier. So kind of analyzing that. Then we're gonna visually draw a line over above the subject's head and then measure from the eyes to that line. In this case, we want it to be about seven inches. The reason this is really important is if I sit my subject on the ground and I want a similar quality and direction of light, then I want the light to be seven inches above eye level for this shot. But if they're really tall, same thing. One of the other measurements we have here is the height of the light above the ground. Now, in this case, what you would do is you'd actually measure the middle of the strobe. So the strobe itself straight down to the ground, but it doesn't help you if the subject is taller or shorter or sitting or standing. So the more important measurement is going to be the height above eye level. So as I said, let's go to seven inches. I'm approximately drag it out here and it gets me just about seven inches. And so that's what you're looking for. Approximately the center of the light, draw an invisible line over and the distance from the eyes to the invisible center of the light. So the last measurement that we have of distance in this shot is going to be the distance of the light off center. Basically what we do is we envision the center of the subject's face and then how far off center the front of that modifier is going to be. And in this case, it's 38 inches which is pretty much what I'm getting here. Maybe I could back it up just a tiny bit. That gets me pretty close. So the last thing that I have to get this light in place is going to be my meter reading. So let's take a moment and discuss how you use a light meter to get an accurate reading. All right, so let's talk about our light meter. All right, first and foremost, fundamentally what a light meter is doing in this case is we're going to use it to read the amount of light hitting our subject. So that gives us the objective ability to keep it the correct and precise measurement no matter what scene that you are shooting. All right, now where we need to begin is you wanna look at the camera settings that I have set up. In this case, for this particular shot, I did 1 200th of a second, F14, ISO 100. Those measurements are going to be really important because first of all, I need to make sure I have the same ISO set on the meter it's going to read at that particular ISO what, how much light it is receiving. So what I need to do is I see that light number one has a power of F14. It's basically saying at ISO 100, that light correctly exposed is at F14 of an aperture. So what I need to do is I need to adjust the power of my light until the meter reads F14. So I'm gonna hit this little side button on the meter, and then I'm gonna test it here. Okay, so what it is telling me is currently, at this distance of light and this power of light, I'm getting a meter reading of F10 at ISO 100. What that says to me is I need the number to actually read F14. So from 10 to get to 14, I have to turn the power of that light up, which is what I'm going to do. So you want to match it. Whatever it said the power of the light is, I need to get a meter reading so that ISO 100, which is what my camera was at, that it'll read F14 here. So let me turn that up. Perfect, F14. So this is telling me at those camera settings, everything is going to be correctly exposed. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a, a shot with just that first light. Setting my camera to the camera settings listed there. Camera settings F14. 
1 200th of a second, ISO 100. All right, so we have light one set up and you can see that it is roughly the correct exposure on the subject. I also want you to keep in mind that if a subject has a different skin tone, the results will look a little different. So if the subject, for example, has a darker skin tone, the light won't look quite as bright. And this is an example of maybe where you wanna deviate from the lighting recipe guide just a little bit. Maybe on the main light with a darker skin tone, you do wanna go up a third of a stop or even a little bit brighter until it looks pleasing to the eye. So yes, it's a lighting recipe, but I don't want you to get locked in at the expense of not having a good photo. The most common question that photographers have when using the lighting recipe guide is they'll say, what does the power of the light mean? Typically they're expecting or hoping that it means uh, whatever the number reads, that's what you turn to the back of the light. So for example, if it read you know, 5.6, they're hoping they could change the power of the light on the back and make it read 5.6, but that is not how it works. For example, uh, if you change the power of the light on the back to read 5.6, and then you change the modifier and the distance of light, the way that it looks like on the subject will not be the same. Instead, what you need to do is take a reading of the amount of light hitting your subject, and that is what a light meter is for. So in other words, if you want to actually use, in the lighting recipe guides, you actually wanna use the power of the light, you need a light meter, you take a measurement, and you're reading how much light hits the subject, you want your light meter to read whatever that number is. So if it says the power of the light should be F14, when you take the meter reading, it should say F14. Otherwise, you kind of just have to eye it, like if you're not using a light meter. So you could look at it and say, oh, the, you know, the light in the face doesn't look bright enough and you could turn it up. That is one way to do it, but using a light meter is the only precise way. So to summarize this, the power of the light is not based on any settings on the back of your strobe. It has to be achieved with a light meter, otherwise you are simply eyeing it. All right, so that is light number one. Let's pop on to light number two. All right, for light number two, we are going to set up the light on the right hand side of the frame, which is the one by four foot strip softbox. Once again, if you don't have that exact modifier, what do you have that is similar or roughly equivalent? If you had a one by three foot strip softbox, that would be very similar. If you didn't have exactly the same quality of light, maybe you could make do with a three by four foot, but where you taped down and hid some of that softbox so it made a little bit more of a strip shape. All right, now, as I look at the measurements here, there's something that is missing. One of the things that's missing is the distance from the background. And that's because it doesn't really matter. We're not lighting the background in this instance, and it's not really going to help you triangulate things too much. So sometimes if there is a measurement not present, it's because you have a little bit of flexibility in that department. Instead, what, what is more important is the distance of the light to the subject. So we're going to measure from the middle of the modifier to the subject's shoulder. And in this case, it's telling me it should be about 39 inches, distance of the light to the model. I mean, that's perfect. That's already pretty close to in place, maybe just one inch over. Let me turn that light on, okay. Let me look at the next measurement here. All right, so I have the approximate distance of the light to the model, and next let's do the height. I'm going to measure from the floor to the light itself, and I've got 52 inches, so let's see how close we are so far. So 52 inches, mm, I can lower it maybe two inches to get exact. So the last part of this is getting the meter reading. Again, ISO 100, but it says that the meter reading should be F7 on this one. So let's see if I can get it close to F7. Oh, that was, okay. That was lucky. F7 right away means it's correctly exposed. And so now if I take a shot, the main light and the rim light should look pretty close to the final image in the lighting recipe guide. All right, so far so good. And now we are on to our final light, which is the background light. This is going to be a light on a floor stand, which I can see from the behind the scenes image. And it also has a 10 degree grid on it. Now with the pro photos, the D1s and the D2s, the 10 degree grid fits directly onto the head itself. However, with other lights and other modifiers, you'll often have a zoom reflector, a silver reflector, and then a honeycomb grid that fits into the front of it. The reason I say this is that different grids have a little bit different spread of light. So maybe with your strobe and the company that you use for your modifiers, maybe the 10 degree grid it has light that spreads out a little bit more. So you will need to make adjustments based on the gear that you have. So right now, let's start with a uh, 10 degree grid. It's already on there, already on a floor stand. Distance to the background is 67 inches. And um, distance from the model doesn't matter. 
off center is zero, so it's nice and centered to the frame. So I'm just gonna get the 67 inches and then we're going to take a meter reading after that. So 67, so I'm just gonna move it back just a little bit and I am measuring to the front of the light. Okay, so the front of the modifier. So I'm just gonna back it up just a smidge and I'm going to turn that on now and I'm going to use the modeling light because I need to have that light centered to the frame. Let me grab my meter again and I need it to read F14. So let me center this a bit more and then I'm going to point and hold the meter in the center of this circle. So it was reading F10, I'm gonna turn it up. Okay, perfect, F14, one. So now we should have everything set. We have the modifiers correct. The distance of the light, the distance of the light above eye level. I've taken meter readings of each of these. And so now, let's see if it all comes together. So you can see that these three lights have worked together, moving us in the direction of this headshot. And it's very similar, if not exactly the same as the photo we are referencing. So let's bring this all together. Where you wanna begin is you wanna set up your camera, make sure you have the same camera settings to begin with. From there, roughly set up your lights in the correct position with whatever modifiers that you have that are closest to the ones used in the guide. Next, use the distances to approximate the position of the light. If you know how to read and see light, you can analyze the position of the shadows and highlights on the face to get it even more precise. You'll want to measure the distance of the light, the height of the light off ground, maybe even take a look at the distance of the light off center, but most importantly, the distance of that light above eye level. And then lastly, you can either eye the exposure of each light or you can use a light meter to get it precise. All of those things together help you unlock the power of the lighting recipe guide. So if you take all of these things into consideration, you can create a shot that is really close or exactly what you saw in the guide. And from there, you shouldn't limit yourself. From there, you can vary modifiers and position of light and power of light and adjust your subject and the subject matter so that you can create endless different variations. Now you are ready and understand how all of this information works together. So you can take control and take advantage of these lighting recipe guides and then add your own twist. Now, if this is your first guide or maybe your second or you're looking to grow, well, I have more than a dozen lighting recipe guides starting from one light and moving up to creative lighting and multiple use of gels. So whatever type of photography you do, there's lighting recipe guides just for you. See you next time, guys.